I realized I wasn't doing my calling. I missed helping people. Like I meant to advocate. I meant to be a voice for voices. I meant to stand in the gap. I uh, ended up going to the next county, Orange County, and getting a job working in foster care. And took a major pay cut and uh, a whole different lifestyle. It was not glamorous, <laughs> but I can tell you, you know, within like, a, a, honestly, a week, I could say I was just like, wow, this is it. The Ms. Texas Show is a voice of hope for victims, survivors, advocates, and community leaders against gender-based violence to share their stories and resources. We began showcasing life in Texas. Today, we are impacting lives not only in Texas, but also around the world. Under our segment, Military Time, we run this segment in partnership with the National Veterans Chamber of Commerce. We invite military and veterans who have overcome traumatic events to share their experiences during and after their military service. Under our beauty segment, we invite fellow pageant winners and contestants, artists, musicians, actors, models, and dancers, and last but not least, our survivor leaders from family violence, sex trafficking, sexual assault, stalking, and other traumatic events who are ambassadors for these causes to share their lives and the impact they have made. To become a guest on our show, email us at msusatexas at gmail.com. If you would like to support victims and survivors of gender-based violence, make a tax-deductible donation to Hope Picks Global at www.hopeyxglobal.org. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Miss Texas Show. Today, we have a very, very special guest. Um, I'm a big fan of him, Mr. Ken Henry. And he's like so passionate about all the stuff that we're doing to fight for the freedom of the survivors from human trafficking and drug roles. Here is the Chief Communications and Partnerships Officer from United Against Human Trafficking. A big welcome, Ken. What? <laughs> good uh good morning good morning and good afternoon to viewers who are in other parts of the world and good night to some of the others um thanks for having me on aline we know i love you love your work and uh we it's a pleasure just collaborating with you uh in the movement so i'm glad to be here well thank you so much ken um i know that we encountered uh, how long have we met? Like a year ago? Uh, I think like uh, two, about, about two years ago, actually. A year, year and a half, a year and a half, a year and a half for sure. Not long, but I yeah. realized that we've got so much done because of your leadership. And I'm I'm not trying to burden you up. It's just like, you know, I love your vision and love your leadership. And you've told me a little bit of how, you know, you went about, you're from Louisiana and then went to LA and now back because of the passion, what, you know, led you the way. So share with yeah. your, uh, with our audience to, and tell us about your story, how you got involved in this and uh, what you, uh, you know, you were doing and what you're doing now. Gosh, that's a very loaded question. <laughs> you know, I have a I replication of that. I do get that question. And I, you know, um, because I think it's also fascinating. I ask that question too, because when we think about human trafficking, this is not something, you know, first of all, anyone grows up and say, Oh, I want to work in human trafficking, you know, it's something that we didn't even want to believe exist. Um, and it's something we definitely don't want to exist. So um for me, it was really just I got called into it, to be honest with you. Um, you know, I graduated. My vision was, you know, from a little kid, I want to be an attorney. I want to be a fashion designer. I had all these things, you know, and then, um, you know, I ended up going to school for broadcast journalism and getting my degree in that and sociology um, in Louisiana. And uh, after that, I was like, what do I do? You know, uh, do I do the fashion school? You know, go try that now. Move to California, move to New York. Do I go to law school? So confused. And at that point, I had a mentor who was a retired uh, Navy veteran um, at the uh, facility that I worked at for abused and neglected kids. And uh, he he was so awesome. And he just really wanted me to be in the Navy and <laughs> kept pushing that. <laughs> So I, you know, ended up taking the test and then I was supposed to come to Houston, Texas to do uh, the officer's exam for the Navy, but I had already applied also at the law school and the fashion school. And lo and behold, the Monday, I was the Friday before I was going to go take the uh, officer's exam for the Navy, 
I received the letter from the fashion school, not, I'm sorry, the letter from the um, uh, law school in Baton Rouge saying I was accepted. And then a phone call, which I did not believe, and still to this day, I'm like, I know a phone call from the fashion school in Long Beach, California. And I was so confused. And I just remember making a decision, the decision, long story short, is to just do the thing that was probably the most unpractical <laughs> And that was to move, <laughs> move to California uh, with no support system and go ahead and do this thing and give it a shot. Because I felt if I didn't, I would never do it. So I went to L.A. I did fashion. I graduated from the fashion school, worked in the fashion business offices, manufacturing offices, um, produced shows, um, worked on shows like the Big More Cities Benz. And I'm like, oh, my God, I'm interning on e-entertainment and all these things that I dreamed about. And um, but I wasn't happy. And uh, after a while, because it, it was short lived, I didn't understand why, what was wrong. And am I ungrateful? Am I becoming one of these L.A. people that, you know, are entitled? Like what what's wrong? And um, well, I realized I wasn't doing my calling. I missed helping people like I meant to advocate. I meant to be a voice for voices. I meant to stand in the gap. Um, uh, and. I didn't know what to do. And so I just, uh, it, lo and behold, ended up going to the next county, Orange County, and getting a job working in foster care and took a major pay cut and uh, a whole different lifestyle. It was not glamorous, <laughs> but I can tell you, you know, within like, uh, uh, honestly, a week, I could say I was just like, wow, this is it, though. This is it. And so, you know, I had a great career there, you know, and um, moved up and um, eventually getting my own nonprofit. And during that time, I learned about human trafficking. And I thought, wow, this was just an international issue. I didn't think it was a domestic issue. And so I couldn't sleep. I remember three nights of not being able to sleep, of having bad dreams, of seeing uh, visions of people being you know, victimized. And I thought I was going to move. Like literally, I was preparing to move to Thailand because I had read a book there, a true story. And um, then I found out we had a company that did that in Orange County. And I applied and uh, I did not get accepted because they said I didn't have experience. And at that point, I'm like, who has experience in human trafficking? So I was finally able to, in Los Angeles County, get an organization that gave me a shot. And um, and that's when I grew. And um, then I ended up going to the Human Trafficking Leadership Academy. I got chosen uh, right away, actually, to be a part of that. And that experience really opened my eyes. Being with that academy, um, it was 12 of us in accord and being there with survivors of trafficking, both male, female, being there with uh, law enforcement and service providers like myself, immigration folks, and like everybody at a table trying to figure out what's the best strategy with different passions. And, you know, uh, it was intense, but it was also very good. We learned so much um, and we got to present to the government about those things. And even our the current definition of survivor, what it means to be a survivor, that is our definition that we challenged them to change. And um, they changed it. And class one, you can Google it, look it up, um, go to Human Trafficking, HTLA, and see class one. Um, that was one of the recommendations. So I've been having a rich experience. And I knew that Houston had an issue. I knew that was the second city um, as far as stats go, as far as who had an issue with human trafficking. And I'd always wanted to move to Houston. I always loved the city, grew up two hours away um, and, you know, I made a plan to finally do it. Um, I had a five year plan and I expedited it about a year and a half early <laughs> and uprooted my life and my wife and my kid and came. And, but it's been beautiful. Um, we've been here two and a half years. And I was just so fortunate to be aligned with a lot of the great people like yourself and people in the movement and to really align with United Against Human Trafficking. I still, it's like, that was something for me that was ordained. It was destiny um, to find a place that just really matches my value systems as well, um, that has integrity um, and really means what they say and, and fight hard to do um, the right thing on a daily basis and to understand that it's not about us, but it's about the folks that we're here to serve. Um, and so to do and be able to help with the coalition and expansion, which is what I love, because I did so much of that in Los Angeles, um, you know, helping be one of the founders of the Compton Task Force and like learning all the nuances of that, working with coalitions. And um, I just love that. I love bringing people together and uniting people in the movement and helping people learn how to effectively collaborate because uh there is a difference you know you can collaborate but then there's effective collaboration and so um i've been honestly just able to come in and continue the legacy uh that they already have and yeah so that's how i got pulled in and that's been my work that's amazing ken i i know that this is like a a really really 
a short version of you know your your <laughs> your achievements. I, yes. I you know definitely. And you mentioned about uh you know your five year plan and moving it fast. And I can you know for y'all who are who are listening uh, have not worked yet yet <laughs> with Ken or met Ken yet. Um, I really witnessed like you know you move mountains. You really work the speed of light to make things happen. And you talk about partnership and you talk about, you know, how uh, sometimes people, you know, we all say partnership, but what it really is partnership. And I see that you really put your heart to it. And that really, you know, you mentioned about there were nights that you were sleepless and, and coincidentally I was up three in the morning and I kind of, I cannot sleep. So I can totally feel your passion. Mm -hmm. uh, that definitely, you know, aligns with the goal with United Against Human Trafficking about yeah. uniting people. So I just, um, a, a big round of applause for, you know, all the great work that you're doing. So, um, but I I wanted to go back to your fashion and uh, maybe you can let some of our audience know because I recently found out that, wow, you're amazing. You know, I always admire all, all of your fashionable outfit but I never know you actually were in fashion school mm -hmm. and then I found out that you are doing your endeavor and bringing the labor trafficking uh you know anti-labor trafficking effort into the work with yes. your background of fashion and talk about calling God is amazing yes. and really just he has everything okay. in the bigger plans for us <laughs> we didn't know in, in, in our younger days like myself I was in the supply chain today I can use that so tell us more about you know maybe let us see about what you are doing now Yes, thank you. I mean, yeah, and you talk about full circle. That is so true. Uh, and when you said that, I just got chills because um, it's so true. I, I went to a store. I got triggered. I actually worked in, um, you know, I worked really heavily in the industry in Los Angeles. And I remember working for a man, one manufacturer and I didn't know what human trafficking was. And um, I quit because I felt uncomfortable after a while because uh, there was a room that we never got access to. And so I would ask the people who were there the longest and they said, oh, that's just where the manufacturing is being done. So I saw the, you know, and I communicated very often with the warehouse folks because I had to like do the person to do the selling uh, with the buyers from the different stores and do the campaigns and presentations. Um, and then I had to communicate that to the warehouse uh, for shipments, right? Make sure they got the orders correct and send it to Macy's and whatever store we were dealing with. But um this particular ent uh, entity, I remember, I was like, I have to know what does that look like that side. And so one day, because they would never allow that door to be open, it was always locked. And um, the owner of the company who had an injury was going over there and I knew he was going there. So I intentionally got up to go to the restroom that was near to see if I could look in there. And I looked and I saw through the crack of the door and it just seemed like there was very young kids in there as well. I, the conditions did not look well, and it just bothered me. And so I started doing research and trying to figure out. So um, I ended up leaving. Um, I left there, and then I did a tip, um, you know, about the place and what I think. I, I I didn't know what human trafficking was, to be honest. I just said I felt like something's going on uh, that's not ethical and not legal um, with the manufacturing side. So I think it would really be important if somebody would go. I think I saw kids and they're working on machines. So, um, you know, so that was intense. And it's interesting how I would have never thought full circle I'd be working in human trafficking and dealing with labor trafficking as well and the garment industry because it's very, very, it's a huge, uh, it's one thing I want to wake folks up. It's not just what we commonly talk about as far as like, you know, forms and strawberry forms and this and that, or, you know, just like massage parlors, whatever, but even in the fashion industry that we think is so fun and so glamorous and they're making so much money all over this world, but at what cost, you know, and are you being conscious to figure out these brands that you love, you know, are they ethical or is anyone being exploited? So um, I'm excited to bring that. And I do believe in honor of, you know, there's so much hope and especially like, <laughs> I love the name of your organization, um, because of that word hope in there, um, and you, if you know us that you not against human trafficking, hope and inspiration and being you know positive and looking at the 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 overcoming side of things is big for us. So you know we still want because fashion is fun and it can be fun and it's meant to be I think because it's creative. 
um, but it's never meant to hurt anyone. So we are looking forward to doing more fun things. And we're excited for next year, our big fashion show we're doing in Louisiana to talk about these things. And we've, the planning is going so well. And we're going to have some really um, exciting, you know, people coming in for this. So, um, yeah, it, it's full circle. You know, it's interesting. And I, I do believe that's, yeah, when you said that, it triggered that thought for me. And I'm like, I, I honestly never thought about it till right now, to be honest with you. Like, yeah, that was crazy. I didn't, who would have thought I would have been doing this now, you know? Yeah, totally. You know, um, a, a couple of weeks ago, I, I was uh, in, uh, accidentally, uh, in Louisiana as well, you know, talking to the leadership council, and I, I, I was in my presentation. I had this slide of the balcony view, yeah. and what really like brought the inspiration to me was one day I was driving around in this big parking lot looking for a parking spot. I'm like, where is the parking spot? Because you see the shadow with the sun, mm -hmm. and maybe there is one. Maybe it's a longer truck. We're in Texas, lots of trucks. <laughs> I cannot see. But then when I was parked, I had to go up to a building. And then from the glass window, I'm like, wow, I can see where the spots are. It's just like that. But, yeah. you know, it's miraculous that um, we have not known that the things that we have done in our early years would have really played into a picture of what we're doing now. Exactly. And, our story is different and you are, you know, contributing with your, your fashion. It's just totally amazing. And and you said about, you know, people see the glamorous and and don't we all like people uh, I like to dress up. I mean, even if I have no time now, I'm like, at least I get a chance to dress up in my in my shows and everything and I'll go to those events. But uh, who would know that this is at the cost of someone's freedom? Mm -hmm. And so I really thank you for all the great work you're doing. But, you know, for a lot of our audience, I always tell people we have uh, people who are uh, experts like yourself, who are advanced level, people who are intermediate, maybe know something about who, people who are entry level, maybe don't know anything. So for those who don't know much about labor trafficking in general, and I know that we all have done great work to raise the awareness on sex trafficking. You know, the movie Sound of Freedom has brought great awareness about sex yeah. trafficking. Sees. Can you tell us more about labor trafficking? Can you tell us more about sex trafficking that's happening in our cities? Absolutely. Actually, it's so interesting because this Tuesday I just led our coalition, the United Against Human Trafficking Coalition that we do every two, uh, every other month. That's what it was on. It was labor trafficking. So it was titled Labor Trafficking 201. And basically what we did, because we do have uh, a lot of new members, too, which we're excited about that joined the coalition. Um, so we understand, and some of those are not victim service providers, they're not nonprofits, they're for profits. And so we want to make sure that they really understood um, that the parallels and intersections of labor trafficking, and also to understand what it is and what it's not. And so a lot of folks, you know, it's like, do you guys realize in Houston, but not just our region, in the entire nation domestically, there's a much bigger rates and and we have a much bigger issue with labor trafficking than we do of even sex trafficking and you know but we hear of sex trafficking more and from all the reasons that experts have said it's just a lot more easier to identify here um versus the labor piece uh, but we have been growing so much with the labor piece and there's been so many efforts and uh, I'm loving it. And we want to be one of the ones to lead the way, which is why we had a labor trafficking. This was our second one this year that we focus on labor trafficking. Um, and we're going to be bringing that more into that uh, into the coalition because it's so important that people understand that. Then there is the talk of, well, you know, there's some people say, well, sex is not work. And then there's others that feel sex is work because you're giving your energy and you're doing an activity. So your laboring is just using your body. And so, but bottom line is, you know, make sure folks, you know, understand, well, now if you're a sex traffic, it, um, you know, that means with some perspective, you can be labor trafficked, right? All right. But if you're labor trafficked, does that mean you're sex trafficked? No, you can be a domestic server too, where you're not being having to do sex at all. You can be, uh, there's so many jobs that you can be doing a labor, um, but not necessarily being sex trafficked. So understanding the difference of those and then understanding the smuggling and human trafficking and how that plays a part into it. You know, when you, when, when you're talking about the, um, the, I guess you can say the initial stage is what we talked. I, I shared about that, about, you know, when folks are coming in, especially people undocumented, 
and how they're uh, vulnerable. And we talked about those vulnerabilities, you know, of oh, a huge one is language. I said, imagine going to any other country. If you traveled anywhere in your life and you were not with someone who spoke that land, that native language, then you there's a vulnerability. No matter how powerful you think you are in your country, you you all of a sudden start to feel smaller. You start to feel insecure because you don't you can't really communicate with folks. So imagine having that plus financial vulnerabilities. Um, your your documents are being taken from you, things of that nature, um, and people are just making decisions for your life, and you have no autonomy over it. Um, we talk about what that looks like and how it can start as smuggling, um, but then, and that person is coming well intent, like I'm paying you to come for a better life, maybe I'm fleeing violence, or whatever, whatever that may be, but now this person that is smuggling them over, which is, you know, the trafficker or, you know, and uh, the street term coyote, the coyote, uh, they already have a plan to traffic you. Um, and so just breaking those things down with labor trafficking, making sure people understand the difference of those and then the approach. And they're like, when I talk about the intersections, there is a lot of similar things as far as the vulnerabilities of, as far as the places you're trafficking in. But um, the approach is a lot different. And then the prosecuting piece is definitely different. Um, there's a lot of times where, I mean, you know, you ha we have things like hour and wage, you know, and laws and things of that nature that's already on the books in pretty much every state. So you have those infrastructures there. We're just getting to a place where we're starting to have those kind of things as for sex. And then it's looking so different in every state. It's something that we just can't be unified on. You know, some, you know, we look at the whole uh, full decrim, partial decrim, equality model. I mean, so there's so many things out there. But with labor trafficking, because it's so large, it is such an issue in our nation. There is, honestly... And that's a that's a positive thing. There are a lot of things, groundwork that has been done and a lot of infrastructure that's been done um, that really assist the efforts. You see what I'm saying? Um, so, yeah. And I just think we're, we're going to lead it. United Against Human Traffic is going to be one of those organizations that we're committed to continue to bring folks in like we did at the summit this past May with HPD. And we brought in, you know, investigating folks that have done real case studies. Um, to give examples of how that works and how can victim service folks work with them um, to tackle the issue of labor trafficking. But they talked about the complexities, too, of that. Um, so I think just doing a lot more of that so that we are equipped in our nation so that nobody's exploited uh, and that we're not just focusing on sex, but we are giving equal uh, attention and effort to both is our goal. Thank you. Thank you for always being, you know, the leader in this uh, field. As well, I mentioned earlier, um, there's so much great work that's being done and continue to be done with sex trafficking due to the limitation of grant funding and uh, uh, laws and etc. Uh, but it's definitely that someone has to do, you know, the labor trafficking part, because as you mentioned, it's just hidden, but the impact and the numbers are actually way bigger than the sex trafficking. So I'm really glad, you know, you pointed out the vulnerabilities, because that's something I was going to ask you as well. You know, you, you mentioned one of the pieces about decriminalization, and I'm uh, and I, I agree that it's very um, difficult for us working in a different in this field because each state has different policies and everything. And I'm curious what uh, your point of view is regarding this, because, uh, you know, um, people who are survivors who might be looking for a job, but then they have criminal records. Um, we partner with organizations that help with survivors, but and sometimes, you know, in Texas, the record is sealed to only a certain level. Um, so what mm -hmm. is your view about decriminalization? Because I heard controversies. I would like to hear what you think. Oh, yeah, same here. Yeah. Even within the uh, survivor community, you know, there there's uh, a divide there. Um, but I think we're, I like to focus on what unifies us. Um, and I think that, um, well, I know everybody's want the same thing. No one that I've talked to on that on any side, and I have these conversations on purpose because I really want to see if we can get to a place of resolve and no one wants to see the person being victimized, uh, the survivor being criminalized, being, uh, being further victimized, being arrested and charged and having this record because of their victimization. And I'm like, everyone agrees with that. And I think that's wonderful. What we need to do is make sure, though, that we pass laws that don't 
also allow the buyers and those that are perpetrating being the traffickers to get off the hook. And that's the thing. So it has to be something in place where they're taking where they are still being held accountable um, and, and discouraged and deterred, but also where the survivor is not going to be further victimized and charged and they should not have uh, something on their record because of their victimization, because they were forced to do these things. Um, and then I think that it must have, um, which is one of the things I, I'm feeling like I'm really loving that equality model because we had we flew a survivor in um, two weeks ago from New York, uh, Melanie Thompson, who's amazing. And she has a film called um, Can Oppression Be Liberation? It's very powerful. And there's about three or four survivors that are uh, highlighted on there, which sharing their real stories. Uh, but it's all based on talking about this issue um, specifically. And and uh, they they really pushed the equality model. And I learned so much more having her here um, speaking to our audience um, because it has that aftercare component to it. And that's what I love because you must have an ethic. So now that you have this person has recovered out of this situation, okay, that's great. What is the aftercare component? And then that I think that if we're going to propose any type of bill, you know, we talk about full decrim, half decrim, or equality, you must talk about safety. What's the safety component as the, as well in that? And so I think those are the things for me when I look at it, I look at making sure the buyer and the, the trafficker, they're held accountable. The vic, uh, the person victimized of trafficking is not further victimized and not, a, and, and what I mean by that, by being arrested, having things on their record, um, and then thinking about now, when they're pulled out of there, what's the safety component? Because that should be first. And now what's aftercare looking like? What infrastructure and things are we putting in place to help them thrive now and help them as they're going to heal on their healing journey? So that's that's where I'm at. That's what I look at. And I think I, I hope we can all get to that place because I feel every conversation I have with folks, we end up, all, we say the same thing. And I'm so, okay, so why is that such a divide then? Do we need to create our, a new term? you know, that speaks to all this. And I, that's why I was like, oh, the equality model. I hadn't really heard of that one. And I hadn't really, and that one is speaking to everything I've been feeling and saying. And I think that what we all want. So I'm like, I now I'm having that conversation when asking people, have you heard of this one? Um, you know, and sending them the information on it because I'm like, I think this is the one that we all really are saying. So um, that's my thought on it. That's amazing. Um, you know, I, I, I agree because I worked with a lot of survivors as well. And even, you know, uh, without giving the names, people on different councils, they were reluctant to even go forward with their mm -hmm. situation simply because of the safety reason. And I'm talking about the safety reason at large, because yeah. what if they have children, they have family that are local exactly. and the traffickers them. And unfortunately, I even work with survivors, they can't even tell the story themselves. They they were so scared. They have to use an alias or have someone else. And I even worked with survivors whose trafficker has uh, died years ago, and they are still like scared about the situation. Yeah. So I um you know I I once heard people say, well, what does a protective order really mean? It's a piece mm -hmm. of paper. Can the police arrive there faster than the speed of a bullet? There's all these things that we have to put into consideration. And thank you, you know, for bringing this to the forefront. I'm, I know that I'm on the council as well. If there's anything I can contribute to, I would love to be part of that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Yes, yes, totally. So, well, Ken, this is just like a lot of things to digest for our folks. And, you know, you completely talk about the different angle about trafficking that people have not yet heard about. Uh, what are some of the takeaways you would like to leave with our audience, whether it's call to action or things to watch out for? Yeah, I think it's both, actually. I think continue to, you know, I'm always going to be an advocate for the awareness piece and getting educated on, you know, what knowledge is already out there, what intel is out there from people like myself, you that have just been spending their energy on in this movement, learning um, and, and seeing it evolve um, so that they can protect themselves and they can protect their loved ones. Then I'd like to, the, the call of action is to really get involved, you know, and involvement can look so many ways. It doesn't have to be anything, you know, we, sometimes there's physical disability, some there's time uh, constraints where people are busy. Uh, there's so many things happening, but 
that can mean just inviting someone into your space, inviting someone to your church um, to train on it, inviting someone into your groups, community groups, um, like allowing the awareness piece to come. And then if you have, um, you are healthy and you have the time, volunteer, you know, figure out in your region or your city, your community, is there any organizations doing the work around me that I can plug into? Is there any coalition meetings I can go and attend? Is there any task force meetings I'd be able to go to? Uh, and just kind of figure out who's doing what in your area so you know who to call um, and you can start to even collaborate. There may be possibilities, but even if it's just knowledge um, and you're able, or the last thing and most important is because most of the folks doing this work, we're nonprofits. So we survive off of grants. We survived off of donations, whether it's corporate donations, uh, individual donations of whatever that looks like. There's always something that we can do to help the movement um, and just ask people first to get aware of it, get educated on the matter, and then let it go from there. Because I believe once you hear it, you can't unhear it. And once you see certain things where there's, you know, videos, hear someone speak, you can't unsee it. And then let's just see where that falls on you at. And then you move accordingly. Uh, but that would be the action. Figure out who's doing what locally to you. Reach out to them and uh, see how you can assist. So well said, you know, get involved and do what you can. It, it may look different from each person, but, you know, get involved so that you can make our community a safer place. Thank you so much, Ken. I really appreciate your passion. Like I said, I cannot say enough. I feel it's a blessing that you have been put in my past that I have met with you. And I think that we're going to do like bigger and greater things together. And you're yes. watching the Miss Texas show. And today our guest is Mr. Ken Henry, the Chief Communications and Partnerships Officer from United Against Human Trafficking. Thank you, Ken. Thank you. Honor. <laughs>